Welcome to Monday morning of a very busy week. Uh, exciting, it seems reInvent keeps growing significantly every year, which is um, awesome. So I'm gonna take questions at the end, if that's okay. I'll put aside at least five, 10 minutes, and there's no one in the room right after us, and if you wanna chat, you can grab me outside later in the hallway as well. So I'm gonna talk about walking the tightrope. Uh, coming from Netflix, we've made a number of decisions over the years being in the cloud to balance various dimensions, and I'm gonna walk you through some of those that we've done uh, more recently. So we produce a lot of content. Is anybody here a Netflix member? Does anybody like Stranger Things? Okay, yes. So we have more great content coming out in the next month or two, so I'm really excited about that. Um, quick overview. So you'll probably hear about Netflix a few times. We have quite a few presentations. I think we have 18 this year or something. We sort of continue to grow with the, with the event. We have about 110 million subscribers globally. We're in 190 countries. Um, pretty big growth, about 50% year over year, continuing to expand. Uh, in the U.S., we're about 35% of the traffic at night, and that's held relatively steady. Um, just for clarification, that isn't served off of AWS. We have our own uh, purpose-built CDN called Open Connect that we build. It's on FreeBSD. We hack the kernel all up, and we give these away for free to people around the world. Um, not people, companies. Um, and as far as cloud stats, even though we don't deliver our assets off the cloud, we push a gigantic amount of data um, back and forth on our what we call our Amazon control plane. So we have three primary regions. We operate in primarily US West 2, which is Oregon, um, US East 1, Virginia, and EU West 1 in Dublin, and those are our three big centers. And across that, we support these 110 million subscribers, more devices than that, um, and we run hundreds of thousands of EC2 instances at peak across the three regions, um, and I will talk more about some of the details there. We support a ton of devices. Last year, we introduced downloading actually during reInvent, and so I was able to use it on the way back, so hopefully people find downloading as a, as a valuable feature. So who am I? Um, I have an organization at Netflix, reliability, performance, and cloud infrastructure, and we have three primary goals. And so the first goal focuses on improving availability and performance for the Netflix user, right? When you click play, it works. That's sort of our, our underlying thing is when you click play, it works. Uh, it actually performs well, so we work with a number of device teams and server-side teams to optimize that component. Um, and the second goal is to accelerate innovation, so let our developers develop this sort of as quickly as they can and give them this cloud infrastructure, so making sure that it's um, you know, elastic, robust, uh, secure, and they can get it on demand. That's really our second goal for the team. And then the third one is we can't really forget about cost. And so as we grow our footprint, what we'd like to do is grow our footprint on the cloud in a sublinear manner to that of the business. And so we have a cloud capacity planning team, some of the members are here today, uh, to make sure we keep that in line. I didn't put numbers here, but this really is a prioritized order of goals for my organization. Um, and so obviously availability and performance are at the top. I have multiple teams, a number of them are presenting here at the conference today. We manage the AWS account, we have a chaos team. Um, I have a, the core SRE team that handles site reliability, so when something breaks, we get involved. Traffic engineering, I'm going to talk about our traffic failover mechanism, so we determine how to steer devices to the control plane. Uh, cloud capacity planning is a uh, matrixed organization. I have the cloud capacity engineering function, and it's actually done in partnership with our financial team and our analytics team, and we all come together to form this matrixed organization. Cloud networking, um, last year we moved these hundreds of thousands of instances into VPC and that was quite an undertaking, so my cloud networking team drove a lot of that. They also make sure people have uh, access to new load balancer capabilities um, and we're optimizing for some of our container workloads today in terms of ENIs per instance and so on. And then performance and OS engineering, uh, Brendan Gregg who's on my perf team is giving a presentation here this time. But we actually maintain a base AMI that the rest of the organization builds their app on. It's based on Ubuntu, and we make sure that we check all the boxes around flexibility, performance, matching instance types. Very few teams actually roll their own. Um, I want to do a plug for Netflix OSS. So our open source offering is pretty big. I think we've done a better job in the past couple of years of curating it more, less of a rush to open source things that we might not necessarily have an intention of uh, maintaining. But if you're jumping into the cloud, especially on AWS, feel free to look at our OSS site. Um, it's well maintained, and there should be some great projects there you can use to bootstrap. Uh, Chaos Monkey B2 is out now. Uh, that's one of our most famous in the Simeon Army. Visceral uh, visualization framework, and then Vector is a on-instance, sort of high-resolution, stateless monitoring framework um, that you can install. So these are just ones that my organization has developed, but there's a huge, uh, huge plethora of open source products out there. All right, 
So let's scroll back. This is last year. I was on stage. That's visceral. I had a really cool video playing. Um, and afterwards, I read all the comments, as we always do, and we, we compare our notes within Netflix. And there were a number of them like this, right? I drank the Netflix Kool-Aid and I liked it. And that's when we sort of pat ourselves on the back, like, yeah, people found it exciting, that's great. Um, and then I read ones like this. Um, Netflix brought this presentation data to reInvent last year and people cheered, but this year it was very underwhelming and discussed pretty much the same content they did last year. I was really hoping for something new from them this year, but they are reaching a zenith with their systems optimization. Perfection is not interesting. <laughs> So I let it sink in for a little bit. Um, I don't think we're perfect, and uh, I definitely want to call out that I believe we have many more problems to solve ahead of us than behind us. Um, every year brings new challenges, and so my goal for this presentation is to talk about some of the areas we've innovated in the past year versus talking about maybe what we did in 2007 or 2009 or 2012, because there's a lot of presentations you can reference on that. And if you have feedback like this, please put it in afterwards, because it helps me quite a bit, uh, so I have content for next year. So innovation happens in many forms. I don't even know if some of them are real. This one looked pretty interesting. Um, but people are out there innovating consistently. Uh, and so we, we innovate as well. Um, my expectation is the audience of this room is primarily a number of individuals who make uh, technical decisions for your organization that are complex in nature. I think of it as maybe flying an airplane, right? There's hundreds of dials. Uh, you turn one, maybe nothing happens to the other dials. But in general, you have to be well informed about the decisions and trade-off you're making. Um, and maybe many times you feel like you're the pilot and you have to give the company the thumbs up, like, yeah, we're safe on the cloud, we're making the right trade-offs. And so actually being able to navigate that landscape and make the right decisions for your organization can be challenging. And that's primarily what I'm going to focus on today. Having come from a number of companies, uh, let's say prior to Netflix, one thing I found is people tend to think of many of these various dimensions as like a zero-sum game, right? I'm going to accelerate innovation, so I'm just going to let the reins go a little bit on availability. Or I'm going to really you know, buffer reliability, and as a result, I'm just going to let the cost go off into the wind. And um, sometimes that can be the case. I've found, especially at Netflix, we don't operate uh, under that principle. And so these are the four dimensions I think about, and they tie very closely to the goals of my organization. One is innovation. And what I mean by that is um, allow us to innovate rapidly. I think as a business, we're not in a space that's very quiet. There's a lot of people uh, nipping at our heels, so to say. And the rate at which we develop new capabilities is important, whether it's on the product or even on our studio, our studio side. Um, then there's reliability, security, and efficiency. So these are the four that I think about whenever I make really important decisions for Netflix around the domains that I own or I engage with other partners and think about the trade-offs I have to make. These might be a little bit different for you. And what we've found, and we've talked about this in previous presentations, um, if you think about the traditional curve of availability versus, versus rate of change, people have historically assumed that you slide back and forth on that curve, and the trade-off on one is almost a linear exact impact on the other. And we've talked about shifting the curve, which is the ability to accelerate innovation while also improving availability, and we've been very successful at that. And so we've found that this isn't a zero-sum game, and you just have to be thoughtful uh, in terms of how you go about it. One of the approaches we use in the organization is we do have some shared service teams. We have a cloud platform team. We have my team that handles cloud infrastructure. We have some vertical teams around security, engineering tools, traffic and chaos, performance. Anytime we're trying to solve or optimize for one of these dimensions, our goal is to try to push that down to the bottom. You know, if we're lucky, we'll push it all the way to AWS, then we don't have to do it. Um, but in many cases, because of our specialized uh, needs of, the, org of the, uh, the stack, we'll end up pushing it to the right as well, and we'll have teams implement various capabilities so that those developers, I don't know if you can see, they have capes up there, right? They're the superheroes building our application. They don't have to worry about that because having you know, thousands, you know, thousands of engineers have to worry about reliability and efficiency um, all the time is really quite a, quite a challenge for them. So that's our model. Push it down, down and to the right. So I'm going to talk through five examples of um, things we've done in the last year in these spaces to help optimize these various dimensions. Uh, people have probably heard of Spinnaker. Yeah? Um, that's arguably our most, um, I say our most successful open source project, right? There's teams at many companies, including Google, Microsoft, Pivotal. There's a bunch of open source contributors. It's really become an awesome platform for getting assets out onto a virtualized environment. And we use it internally for all of our developers. So, 
This is from Q3. Um, each of the peaks represents a week, and the height represents the number of autoscaling groups created in production. And for those who aren't familiar with autoscaling groups, when you want to get some code onto the cloud, uh, you'll end up, at least we do, we encapsulate it in what's called an autoscaling group. And that's an entity that then the Amazon control plane will manage for you. It will automatically scale it to certain levels. It'll replace failed instances. And it's how we encapsulate code. So if I need to push a new version of a service, I'll push a new autoscaling group. You can see the weekends or the dips, which sort of verifies that we don't work on weekends that much, which is great. Um, that's a good sign. But during the week, we're typically pushing somewhere, I think, north of 1,500 autoscaling groups um, a day, maybe 1,200, 1,500. And this is globally, just so you know, everybody's not pushing their own service every day. Uh, but still, it's, it's a pretty high rate of change. And sometimes this scares the bejesus out of people, right? Like when they see this, oh, wow, that's really crazy. How do you do that? And they think about, um, you know, engineers and engineers running with scissors, right? Like they just, there's the, there's the production environment, all the customers are depending on, here's people running around it just wreaking, wreaking havoc. Um, and so our solution to that uh, is Spinnaker. This is, my, this is my one old slide, right? Spinnaker V1 pipelines. And so Spinnaker has the concept of pipelines, which is basically a recipe to get your code into production. Um, and you can download Spinnaker and play with it on your own test account. And the recipe you define says, I'd like to you know, tie into this build pipeline, like we have a bakery, so our, co our assets, I think, sit in stash. They go, you know, they get built through Jenkins, they get checked into Artifactory, it automatically bakes an AMI, the AMI gets registered across all three regions, and then the pipeline picks it up, right? And so you can go in and say, my application should be deployed across the three production regions, starting this time of day with these various functional checks in place, staggered by this amount, so it avoids the peak traffic in those regions, and that's a Spinnaker pipeline. Um, and it's fantastic in that it really optimizes all the dimensions I talked about. From a rate of innovation, an engineer can just schedule the push, they check in their code, they do their functional tests. Even as part of the pipeline, it can have you know, a CI and do some functional tests themselves and unit tests. So it allows engineering to scale. From a reliability perspective, it really helps with consistency, right? It makes sure that when we push code, it consistently pushes it in a very deterministic way to say three regions staggered in an appropriate manner. And that prevents us from breaking things just because people are mashing buttons. Security, um, behind the scenes, it makes sure that when things are created and moved around, they actually inherit the correct security groups so you don't have people fiddling with um, the console. In fact, I'm trying to think, very few engineers at Netflix actually interact with the Amazon Web Console. The majority of their interaction with their assets on the cloud goes through um, Spinnaker pipelines. There are some specialized teams that use the console. And then efficiency, uh, it might be surprising that pipelines benefit efficiency, but if you've ever uh, worked in a virtualized environment, have you ever seen somebody stand up a new version of code, like new version of code and leave the old thing running for a long period of time? Yeah, me neither, right? Like, never happens. And so since I'm in charge of efficiency, that becomes a real problem. So the nice thing about Spinnaker is when it stands up the new code, once it's passed all of its tests, it tears down the old ASG, so it does a nice job of cleaning up and maintaining that efficiency, and you don't get a lot of cruft built up. So this is great, right? I could see how this sounds like perfection to people. Um, like, just give us that, and we're good to go. I went in and picked out one application, um, and it had 50 pipelines, right? And this slide is incorrect. The reliability arrow that's green is supposed to be going down. It's supposed to be negative. So in your mind, visualize an orange arrow pointing down. Um, and so we give people this amazing capability, and of course they use it. Why wouldn't you? And then the next thing you know, you have 50 things configured deploying your 50 applications. You might have custom clusters or ASGs doing things. The big risk for reliability here is obviously configuration drift because these are statically defined pipelines. And once they're out there, um, it looks more like this, right? There's all these, these aren't humans, but these are all autonomous pipelines running with possibly very, various levels of configuration. And maybe if our workload shifts, you can think of an example where maybe we don't want to push at this time of day in E-West 1 because we've just made a decision to send another geography there. Going and changing that, I've heard, can be a real nightmare for an engineer to sit down and in their mind try to keep all these pipelines in mind as they go through it. So one thing we did this year was we created a Spinnaker templated pipelines, which I call V2, and that reliability arrow is now green again, which it should have been orange before. This lets you create a baseline recipe, um, like this is my schedule across regions, these are my canaries, these are my rules, and then you can, you can have that inherited by additional pipelines. We're just rolling this out now internally, but I've heard from um, 
some of the engineers on our teams who actually take the time to configure pipelines for their services, they can maintain upwards you know, of 30 or 40 services, and it's actually very easy to configure these pipelines and stay on top of it, and suddenly uh, you know, that cognitive load goes down, so we maintain all the benefits we had before uh, without compromising reliability, because configuration drift can be a real pain in the rear. So that's the first big thing we did in Spinnaker this year. The list is huge. If you see Andy Glover here, the Spinnaker people at the booth, have them run you through all the things we've done in Spinnaker, because I can't, I can't really cover it here. The next one is guardrails. I'm sure no one has ever actually like removed a server group that was taking active traffic, right? I wish I could say that we were proactive. Like we sat around in the room and we thought, hmm, how could we hurt ourselves in production? Maybe we could remove all servers that are taking traffic. Oh, why don't we build something to avoid that happening? We don't do that, right? What we do is we remove all the servers taking traffic and have an outage, and then we say, let's fix it. And so it's sort of, <laughs> when you run fast, you learn from your mistakes. And so one of the nice things about Spinnaker is it's a centralized deployment location, so we can create these guardrails. And in this case, there was a guardrail created that allowed you to specify specific clusters that should not be allowed to be reduced to zero if they're taking traffic. Um, and this was an outcome of an incident, but it doesn't happen anymore. And all the engineers get this for free. Uh, which is fantastic. So we have more guardrails. We have one that handles dynamic property change in production. It tells you how many instances you'll be affecting. If you want to, you can click a button and say, yes, please, let's do this in a manual way, and then it'll page people for fun. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, you can always get around it. Netflix doesn't try to lock you down and prevent you from doing anything. You theoretically could log into any server in production and just start destroying things. But um, we assume no one has an interest in doing that. So I think our, our engineers would like to think of continuous delivery as like this, right? You're just cruising along, you're reading your paper, there is nothing to worry about, your code's gonna be perfect. I think that's a great utopia um, to work for, uh, but I think it's a little bit more like the Tesla model where they want you to occasionally you know, put your hand on the wheel, let me know a human's there because at some point you might have to take over. Uh, and we're probably gonna operate in that period for a while because we're moving quick, there's things we don't, we don't realize as we get there. But the goal is to get to this, um, but today I think we do a pretty good job of this, which is letting one engineer perhaps run you know, tens of tens of pipelines with minimal, minimal level of effort. So that was a big uh, scaling benefit this year. Fast failover. So last year I talked about our ability to move traffic out of the regions. Um, and so that is a mountain goat riding a motorcycle, jumping across a chasm uh, my traffic team has a really good sense of humor, or strange sense of humor, I guess you could say. I haven't asked for what this means. But we call it Project Nimble. And so I want to throw one caveat in here. Netflix, we get up on the stage, we talk a lot, a lot about active-active, you know, multiple regions, our global footprint. One thing I want to call out is, um, you know, when you go on the cloud, it's great. I think you should architect yourself at some point so that you can support multiple regions concurrently and serve traffic for the same customers, as an example. But it takes a lot of effort. We spent a lot of time solving data replication problems, you know, taking the Cassandra backups, replaying them, doing compactions, doing repairs. Um, so if you're just getting into the cloud and you really want to stand things up to be reliable, I think a great starting point is really, even in a single uh, region, maybe multiple availability zones, even if you're only in one data center today, it's an improvement what you have over then. So I'm not saying don't do it, I'm just saying don't rush into it because it's a lot of work, especially if you have other stuff to do. Um, and the great thing is realizing that it's there. So when we actually decided to move to multi-region, it was much more of an engineering effort on our part than anything Amazon had to do um, in general, so. All right, and you won't break your neck. That's just a cool picture I found. This graphic's a little hard to, to read. Um, so those represent our three regions, um, US West 2, US East 1, and EU West 1. And ignore the, the blue and the, the brown, just consider them one, one area. That's the number of users in production clicking start every second, right, on a given title at Netflix. And this is a traffic for uh, approximately two days. That's what the two peaks are globally. And if you look on the far right, what we did is we evacuated our EU West 1 region, which means we took all the devices that were streaming and we said, don't talk there anymore, go to this other location. And we actually redistribute them across the other two regions um, through DNS. Uh, the little boxes represent when the traffic failed over and when the traffic failed back, and you can see a step function there for both US West 2 and um, US East 1. And then after 24 hours, we failed it back. So we do this exercise uh, every two weeks, uh, planned. We also do them, as some people here internally from Netflix that know we do this sometimes unplanned, 
probably a couple times a month. Uh, but it, it used to take us over an hour. So this was the problem we had last year, is we had this great hammer to fail traffic around uh, uh, to solve our problems, but it took up to an hour because we had to scale up the other region. We had to make sure instances were warm. Now we can do it in about five to seven minutes. I put seven minutes because it's closer to seven minutes. So in about seven minutes, any time of the day, we can just mash a button and traffic moves out of one region to the other with a very uh, sort of deterministic set of rules. So I put that innovation and efficiency could take a hit here, and I, may, I put possibly because if you didn't think it through well, it could be a big impact for the teams, right? Imagine 40 service teams running 120 microservices, having to make sure that their scaling policies take into account this rush of traffic that's coming in. And also efficiency could go down. This isn't an instance count graph, this is a sort of a request rate graph for starting movies. So you would probably just pin higher than usual to support that thundering herd. And so efficiency could take a real hit. So that was the problem that my traffic team went back to the board uh, to try to figure out. And so in the last year, we developed Nimble. I call it Nimblification. And so we basically create what's called uh, dark capacity, and it's warm instances. So when you think about it, in these three graphs, the top one is EU West, then US East 1, then US West 2. These are the number of instances in this case that are in production every day. This represents three days. The blue represents the number of instances that are actually serving customer traffic. The yellow represents the instances that aren't serving customer traffic, but they're running in the background and they have yet to be wired into the current ASG, but it's enough capacity to support instantaneous failover. And it auto scales as well. It doesn't auto scale with the needs of the region, excuse me, it auto scales with the need of global failover. And so my traffic team built this mechanism in place called dark capacity, which runs shadow ASGs and then adds them in when it's time to fail over by doing a bunch of API calls. What's important is they not bother the developers, right? And that's where innovation goes back up. So what they do is they have a system that looks at your uh, sort of you know, request rate, for instance, understands the carrying capacity for these 90-ish, 100-ish microservices, and automatically defines the scaling policies to keep the capacity there ready for failover. The reason efficiency went back up is they could have just pinned high um, to support that failover, but instead they actually free up all that capacity, you know, millions of hours of compute available for other purposes. And there is a presentation here uh, by Rick talking about encoding at scale, and we call this our internal spot market or our trough. And so this is basically free capacity other people can use. So when this isn't being used um, in production, we spin up encoding jobs in our account. And so most of our encoding is actually relatively free because it's running in this trough and it encodes video in five minute chunks. More details on Rick's presentation. But um, so it's a great win for efficiency as well. And it allowed us to reach that um, seven minute failover. So that was really great. We continue to evolve it. One thing you might notice is in the top one, in EU West 1, it's running with a lot more nimble capacity than the other two regions, right? It actually has more nimble capacity in some cases, I think, than it actually has in active capacity. And the way we handle our capacity globally for failover is we don't support the capability for a single region to fail to any other region. We actually do a two-way failover. So like if we have to evacuate US West 2, we actually take the 80% of the traffic in US East 1 and concurrently fail it to EU West while we're failing over US West 2 at the same time. And this lets us maintain a much smaller uh, instance footprint because these are, these are reserved instances, zonal, zonal reservations. Um, and vice versa, so US East 1 actually runs with the least amount of headroom because we rarely fail more traffic in that region than it has at any given state. So nimble to the rescue. And there's a blog post on it that has many more details about the capabilities we built, the APIs we use. So, but there's no presentation on that here today, I think. Um, uh, jump into security. This is not my domain of expertise. We do have a number of security talks here. Um, but again, when we talk about security, they have to consider themselves as one of those four dimensions. Although typically when a security guy comes to my office, I just say yes, yes, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be, there's been a few breaches this year, right? I don't want to be one of the people that causes one of those, and so I, I nod quite a bit. Um, but uh, we built something called Aardvark, and it was helped to deal with the complexity of our environment. And this, again, is sort of taking the complexity an engineer would experience every day if they had to navigate the console and figure out all their details and pushing it down farther into the stack. So there's about 2,500 um, you know, role permissions available in Amazon. Think of an example as I would like to put something in this S3 bucket, right? That's a permission. And so there's a ton of them. And if your application depends on all these permissions, if any of them are set incorrectly, 
your application will usually break, right? And so what do people typically do? We have overly permissive deployments, right? There's a way you can say, just give me all permissions and just make it for the account because then things can run well. And that's, that's uh, very risky, right? Because if someone were to compromise our account, it's sort of like a playground, right? They just walk around and they just grab, you know, or open store with no clerks or something, just grab whatever they want. So the security team saw this as a problem and they implemented something called, um, you know, Aardvark. And so Aardvark, uh, um, sorry, I'm just thinking about this next thing. So Aardvark is um, a mechanism whereby we, and there's a blog post on this, where we scrape the Amazon security API and we pull down all of our permission definitions. It takes about 20 minutes every day. And then we run audits against that internally and we actually have another open source utility we're building called RepoKit. I'm not sure if it's open sourced yet, but it actually performs the audits and makes sure that the correct permissions are applied. Um, we're going through a process right now of trying to leverage this where when people first create a service, they maybe deploy it in a more unrestricted fashion, and then we monitor it for a period of time, and after, say, a few days or a week, then we actually define appropriate security groups and roles and apply it down. So starting, uh, you know, more permissive and then get to be less permissive without breaking the application, which is really cool. So Aardvark basically extracts records, stores it, and then sent, you know, makes it available. Um, via REST API. Capacity, one of my passions, you'll see that I think two of my presentations um, at reInvent previously were on capacity. This is a screenshot of Spinnaker and that little box that's highlighted in red, which you might not be able to make out. I typed in 10,000, I didn't hit submit, but in general it's a free form box where people can request as many instances as they want. There's no procurement process for um, capacity at, at Netflix. We operate in relatively few large accounts. So if you're an engineer and if I wanted to create a, uh, a new cluster auto-scaling group called Coburn and I wanted 1,000 M42XLs, I would just go type it into Spinnaker and it'd show up as long as the capacity's there. And it's uh, the capacity planning team's job to make sure that it's there. Um, and so I think our engineers sort of look at capacity like this. Like they're driving along, like I need a little more capacity. <laughs> Nothing involved other than turning the dial. Um, there are some cases where this doesn't work if someone asks for an excessive amount. I think we had a case last quarter where someone wanted half a petabyte of GB, GP2 without warning or something, and that caused some problems. There were some limits there that we dealt with, but um, there, there is a bound to it, but for the majority of work people do, they can fit within, uh, fit within the footprint, which is great. This is a look at our auto scaling by region every day. So imagine these are all the instances running across the three regions. We scale, um, we auto scale about 25% peak to trough. So those hundreds of thousands of instances, at some point throughout, through, throughout the day, about a quarter of those are freed up for their purposes. You might wonder why the entire footprint doesn't scale, and that's because we actually have a fairly large stateful component as well. If you think about our monitoring system atlas, you think about our you know, 300 Cassandra clusters running globally across like 8,000 nodes, um, our big data cluster running Hadoop, and uh, you know, we have Spark clusters. We have a customized version of Memcache called EVCache that we open source, which lets you run Memcache and replicate your data across AZs. Those tend to not auto scale, so that's what this uh, sort of baseline is here. But that's still quite a bit of capacity to auto scale. So if you were to really blow this out and drill in on a day, what you would see is people pushing code all the time. Remember I showed we were upwards of maybe, you know, 1,200, in some cases 2,000 auto scaling groups a day. That's almost all coming out of this capacity pool. And so we could do a couple of things. One is we could purchase reserved capacity to make sure engineers always get what they want. And I'm not going to say that we never get iced, you know, insufficient capacity exception. It does happen. The cloud's extremely elastic, but you know, to a limit, just like your data center. Actually, most data centers aren't elastic, but let's, let's assume it, it was. Um, and so each year, in our, uh, the, uh, the team that handles the cloud capacity finance component with our, within our cloud capacity function tends to look at a lot of the details behind the scenes and work the numbers around what reservations make sense by account, uh, by various workload. And every now and then, Amazon will release new capabilities, and then some of them don't necessarily work great at our scale. Uh, it might be things where you say, okay, tomorrow I need five instances and I'm good. We usually need like thousands of instances. So they introduced this thing called regional um, RIs. I've heard flex is not a word that we use for that. Um, and so one thing I've talked about in previous presentations is we always depend on on-demand, right? Every, every day of the year, Netflix is running an on-demand some percentage of the time. Historically, it's probably 
one to three percent at various times, and then what we do is we backfill capacity. So we depend on the elasticity of Amazon to let us innovate very quickly. We don't try to uh, purchase all of our capacity and make sure we have it to cover every need that comes up, and some are sort of temporary. You might stand up a big cluster and that cluster might go away. So we have this on-demand spend, and then one thing we recognized um, was that we were also spending a little bit more on reserved instances than we need to. We were being a little bit more aggressive and backfilling quickly. Uh, one thing I haven't covered is we tend to align along relatively few instance families that are very large. So when you think about the available um, instance families Amazon has, there's M, the general purpose, right? Uh, C, compute, um, R for high memory, I's for uh, high IOPS, right? So for us, we use that for Cassandra, Elasticsearch things to have very high IOP requirements. Uh, D2's, you know, for really large spinning disks, and we use that for some of our big data workloads. And so all of our, you know, thousands of microservices um, that run on, on Amazon fall into those pretty much five family groups. There's some GPU on the side for ML and so on, but most of it are those five families. And in fact, the M family, is probably close to 40 or 50% of our footprint. So we try to migrate towards the general purpose family because we don't need that extra 10% in most cases on CPU or whatever the, the benefit is for C. And so as a result, that's how regional works really well because a, a zonal RI or reserved instance, which we have the majority of our footprint on, I have to tell Amazon, I would like an M42XL in US East 1E um, and then it's, it's, I can't do anything else with it. It's sort of locked into that type. It gives me good financial benefit it gives me a greater chance of there being the equivalent of a capacity land, like it will be there when I need it. Um, the challenge is it's not flexible in terms of instance types if someone else needed one. So regional allows you to basically buy like a, a bucket of credits for a certain family. You could say I'd like to buy 1,000 M4 RIs that are, that are regional. And you put it in a certain region and that lets you launch an instance of any type within that family. It comes out of that credit bucket, and it can be an NEAZ, so you have much more flexibility. I do believe there might be less of a, I wouldn't, you know, capacity guarantee on the back end for a really large ask, but what we found was we started to supplant some of our reservations with these regional ones, and there's gonna be a whole presentation on this, but in general, our on-demand is starting to come down more and more as we get more comfortable with regional. This is our Q2, Q3 is looking a lot better. Um, and it's always finding that balance of what's the right, um, you want to ensure innovation, you don't want to run out of capacity, but this allows us to improve the efficiency curve while the footprint still is growing. So I encourage you to be real thoughtful about um, if you want to step into re reserved instances, think about your workloads, how they use it, and how you need to deploy it. Um, and that's been a big win for us. There are a number of presentations related to capacity and performance that we're giving this year. One specifically on regional reserved instances is happening. Um, at the end of this, I have a list of them. You can probably just search the agenda for Netflix presentations. We work pretty heavily with Amazon on their new auto-scaling capability called target tracking. And so someone from the performance team, uh, Vadim, is going to be presenting on that. And then Brendan's going to talk about tuning Amazon ETC2 instances for performance. But if you're anybody in here who has responsibility for efficiency of the footprint, I think those are great presentations to try to attend. All right. Um, Last thing, microservice availability trends. This was a tricky one. Um, do any of you have individuals in your organization whose behavior you would like to change through information? <laughs> do any of you send them dashboards with time series every week? Like, here's your CPU, here's your cost. You got one person. All right, I know that. We used to do that a bit. We went through multiple phases, right, of here's your performance, it's degrading, or here's your capacity utilization. And it's a big context switch, right, for someone who's doing something else, like building an application to handle bill, you know, billing logic in Norway, or someone, to get a dashboard, they have to open up and start seeing all these time series and try to sort of figure out, interpolate what really is, what it's, what's it telling them. And you get this information overload, and pretty soon you're not getting the desired effect. People are not opening the emails, they're just sending it right, they don't even send it, I guess, I mean, I have Gmail, I just let it roll by because um, it's such a big mailbox. But um, after a while, you just stop paying attention to it, right? Because it's just information. And so Netflix is the first company I've worked at where we very much take into account we would like to have context over control, right? I can give you an example in terms of reliability. If I have an incident in production, um, the first thing that comes to mind is, wow, that team is really, it, well, the first thing that doesn't come to my mind is that team is operationally poor, right? Like, why can't they just push their code safely? What's up with them? You know, don't they know production's important? 
And what I'll do is I'll lead with the, the question of, have I given that team enough context to make the right decision, right? Do they understand how they're putting production at risk? And additionally, are the tools providing sort of this foundation to avoid that breakage? And that's uh, context versus control in the context of Netflix. We're actually not a mandate-driven company, so I can't really walk around with like a stick and point at people and say, you know, you improve your availability. Um, there's no VP telling them they have to do something. So it's really a data-driven um, data practice, and that's why I think the word data is important too. So we ask people sometimes, uh, you know, what do you think the difference is between context and information? Because we have lots of information flowing at us every day. And context, in my mind, at least how I apply it, is typically taking that information and distilling it down and applying a set of maybe domain-specific logic and being able to formulate it in a way where if there's an action I want somebody to take in this organization, in my organization, how do I structure it in a way where I get that to them at the right time with the right level of information so they don't have to do a lot of decoding and get frustrated? So availability is one of those dimensions that we look at. Um, we have what are called efficiency, we, they were efficiency scorecards, now we call them, we switched them over to be availability focused. But, um, the little box on the left, you would receive an email once a week, and you would receive this email, and it's called Microservice Availability Scorecard or Report. And for all the, um, all the microservices your teams own, and this usually goes to the manager and the team gets copied, if you're failing to meet the availability goal of your service, you'll get an email that has this little box that says, hey, in this, in this case, playback something service was failing to meet its four nines, right? If it was achieving its goal, they would receive no card, right? There's no need to bother someone if there's no need to bother someone. Um, and then we look at the trend over the last 13 weeks and we've modeled the system such that in, we don't look at the given service to determine their availability, we look at all of their peers. Some, this isn't an original idea, by the way. Um, I remember working with Pinterest, someone from Pinterest a little bit and they had an availability scorecard model once, it was really cool and I think even Twitter has one where they look at the behavior of the callers to a given service and use that signal to determine if you're available or not. So we actually use our platform libraries to determine the availability of a service based on how its clients perceive them. And it's not meant to be a blame game, it's just meant to expose context so people can make the right decision if necessary. So if I sent you this scorecard and you clicked on it, it would take you to this report, and this is a, a Tableau report, and it shows your availability over the past like 13 weeks if it's green, it means you're achieving your goal. If it's red or yellow, it means you're not achieving the desired goal. If it's red, it means you've decreased compared to the previous week, and if it's yellow, it means you've improved and you're on, on the right trajectory. And so right away, you get a bunch of information out of it. But again, it's still not enough information to be actionable for the end user. Like, where would they go from here? They would know it's bad, but they have no idea um, what could be driving that change. So the next step we go is you click on the next, you click on one of the bars and you say, I'm interested in whatever week that is. And you bring up the second level view and the second level view shows you for that same service, this is data for that week. Um, there's two, two panes, right? One on the left, one on the right. The one on the left has two sets of data. The gray bars represent the number of calls being made per hour against your service and the green slash red bar represents the availability of the clients talking to you and it will expose the number of requests, it'll show how many failed, it'll show if they failed, was it either maybe your thread pool was sized too small, maybe you're actually throwing errors. Um, there can be a number of reasons that requests fail and we pick like the top maybe four categories uh, using our library called uh, Hystrix. We also threw in on the right side your downstream callers, right? Because every microservice or most of them are dependent on downstream services as well and so this is for the exact same time period it shows your behavior to your callers downstream and sometimes this will let you see I had a hit in availability to my clients, it actually turns out it was the service below me and then there's really nothing for you to do except maybe consult with that service and see how you mitigate that. But I've heard that a number of managers will take this report and they get about 90% of the information they need out about this and they can send it to the engineer and the great thing is when their availability takes a hit, they can navigate right to the time that it happened, they can take that then go into their detailed dashboards with all their information and start drilling on it and solve the problem. So it's all about shortening that cycle from um, having something you want to be actionable and then providing domain-specific context. And we're doing the same things in the areas of efficiency, right? We have really awesome dashboards that our, our Cloud Capacity Finance team creates that lets you see growth over time and trend by application based on, on size. Um, 
And this improves innovation and reliability. Innovation because engineers, it allows them to spend less time digging through the data to figure out what could be the problem, um, or at least get closer to the root cause. And it, uh, it improves reliability because we're identifying which services in the, in the ecosystem are a little bit weaker. And these aren't all engineering inflicted problems. Sometimes it's just a configuration change that needs to be made where a throttle is set to low. And sometimes you'll see failures at peaks of auto scaling because a service might be fine, you know, 95% of the day and then it hits that one top of the, the peak and then it starts having some failures. So pretty excited about the, the scorecards. So again, that's, that's the maximizing of context for people. Uh, we put a lot of thought into that. We're still evolving it. We have to break it down in different ways. Um, but hopefully, hopefully it'll, it'll work, get people there. So I've talked about those five, um, the four dimensions, right? Innovation, reliability, security, and efficiency. Those are mine. I don't own them, but those are the ones I really care about. And so I think, uh, you know, as a business, understanding how to find your direction, especially on the cloud. One thing I didn't call out explicitly um, is that once you're on the cloud, that dimension of innovation speeds up very quickly on you, right? As an organization not on the cloud, you might have to you know, procure facilities, procure hardware, flash the hardware, set up the security policies, and it might take three to six months sometimes for people to get a system. If you go the route like we do of letting someone get capacity within a matter of minutes, suddenly that innovation uh, model can start to overrun you. So you need to be thoughtful about these other dimensions because they change significantly from how you handled it in the past. You can't really say, Okay, team, we're going to be increasing the rate at which we push code. Why don't you go take a year and write a, create a project and try to figure out how we're going to create code because, you know what, in two weeks there's going to be ASGs everywhere. So you want to get in front of this um, if possible. So sort of, sort of sped through this. Um, it, is, it is a difficult balance, balancing act, um, and your stakeholders of the business might not always feel particularly compassionate about other people's domains. You might say, hey, we're gonna go this way, and someone might say, you're gonna slow down my innovation, and then someone's gonna say, you're spending way too much money. And so thinking about how you frame this, I spend a lot of time thinking about how I frame these dimensions, and usually if I have a discussion with someone about the trade-offs that are being made, um, we come to a pretty reasonable solution. Um, the cloud can help in a number of respects, as I talked about in terms of maximizing leverage. I mean, you could do that with your, uh, you know, with your own VM-based deployment in your own facility, I guess. But being able to build these facilities into the shared service platforms, and we heavily leverage the cloud's capabilities around security groups, around auto-scaling, right? We just say, take our instances in an ASG and split them across three availability zones, right? So even in those cases where you do have a shortfall of capacity um, in one availability zone, the auto-scaling group will still grow to the desired number of instances. You'll get through peak and then it'll come back down. So there's things you can do in the cloud that give you flexibility you probably don't have today within your data centers. So take home work. Um, if you haven't done this already um, and you're, you're in the position of having to make sort of very challenging technical decisions for your organization, you know, do a five minute exercise. Sit down, take out a piece of paper or use a computer. Um, and write down your optimization model. If you're someone who has to make these trade-offs, what, what do you consider most important? What does your business consider most important? And how do you bring those together? Because you'll probably find yourself sitting at the center of that more often than not. Given, given my teams and what they do, I find myself sitting in that every day at work. Um, it's very exciting. And then also context versus control. I've had a lot of discussions with companies out there about context versus control. I think owning a reliability engineering team um, uh, it leads to a lot of those discussions as well. There's companies that have error budgets. There's companies that restrict your ability to push code if you have a certain number of incidents. We aren't there yet. I hope, I'm hoping by having better context distributed to teams in general, we're not going to be there because it would slow us down a bit. Uh, I should also call out in all of this, you know, we move very fast. Netflix makes a lot of very quick decisions. We innovate quickly. When Netflix is down, planes don't fall out of the sky and people don't die like life machines, you know, whatever, life-saving life machines don't go off. So we have a little more flexibility in how renegade we can be sometimes. Um, you might not stream for a while. You know, I think someone else jokes about go outside and play with your kids for a bit, um, <laughs> which is okay every now and then, uh, but not when Stranger Things 2 launches. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> um, so think about that as an organization, about where you draw that line with, with people in terms of how you get them the, the right data slash context to make the right decisions. I'll take questions in a minute. One thing I wanted to point out is we have a, a number of talks coming up over the next few days. My guess is if they're really popular, there might be repeats, and they will always be uh, recorded and available after the session. They did a great job last year getting all the talks up. We have some on security, um, day in the life of the Netflix engineer. That's when we've done uh, past couple years, pretty exciting. Someone from the reliability team. 
Brendan's going to talk about tuning EC2 instances. We're going to talk about um, orchestration, you know, machine learning training, and how we're using it for our recommendations. I, I, don't, I assume they're not going to share the secret sauce, but they'll talk about the capabilities we use. Uh, we now added in a cloud network engineer role, so my cloud networking team is going to talk about how it differs to manage the network on a cloud vendor per se in the data center and, and how that's different. Regional reservations mentioned that. Another security one, uh, performing chaos at scale, that's Casey who leads my uh, chaos engineering team, and he's going to talk about the chaos experiments we run at large scale. So chaos monkey is really a pretty small piece of code, right? It goes around and shoots stuff at a certain rate. There are many, much uh, larger experiments we run on the cloud. Um, and then access advisor, security again, um, auto scaling, the demon from the Herf team presenting on that. Uh, da, da, da. Encoding at scale, that's the one where if you're interested in how you can possibly use spare capacity, could be even the, you know, the Amazon spot market could work for you as well. We talk about how we scale and get up to 90% utilization of our trough. And we're using Kinesis a little bit more and more, so when possible, we try to push that undifferentiated heavy lifting over to the Amazon services. Uh, and then the last one, I'm not actually sure what the tooling up for efficiency is, you'll have to read up on it. Um, and then our data pipeline, we run a really large data pipeline that uses Flink for routing and Kafka on the back end for sending data. We even use it for cross-region replication of our, our data streams. So if you're interested in how we're doing, um, how we're doing our data platform, uh, please attend that on Friday. And that's it. So we have about 14 minutes left. Uh, does anybody have any questions? <laughs>